take it away, Morgan. All good. Hi, everybody. Uh, thank you for having me here today to talk to you about our comprehensive plan. Uh, I'm just going to share my screen here real quick. If I could just see a thumbs up whenever you're able to see it. Cool. Um, like I said, my name is Morgan Pemberton. I'm in long range planning in the city planning and development department with the city of Kansas City, Missouri. Um, I've been with the city about a year and a half and it's taken me that long to be able to say that title without stumbling over my words. And right now, most of my focus in what I'm doing with my work is I am collaborating with Gerald Williams, another long range planner, and we are kind of spearheading the, the project of updating the city's comprehensive plan, which is a pretty considerable undertaking. Um, we started this process initially um, in late 2019 uh, with planning, and then we were going to do a big kickoff event and start you know, the big public engagement and outreach plan that we had put together. Uh, and then about a week later, um, after we were planning to have our uh, kickoff event, um, the week before uh, the pandemic hit. So we had to completely change how we were planning to approach this project. Um, and we've been doing it primarily online right now. Uh, we know that there's a lot of um, digital equity issues with making sure that people are getting engaged online. People may, who may not have access to Wi-Fi internet service in their homes. So that's a, a lot of the things that we've been contending with over the last year. Um, we've been doing our best to kind of jump over those hurdles. Um, but I will explain a little bit more about that. So basically the comprehensive plan is going to guide land use and development decisions for the next 20 years in Kansas City. And it's called a comprehensive plan because those decisions are directly related to um, literally dozens of other policy areas that the city is involved with in making decisions on. Um, we're talking about housing, uh, transportation, uh, economic development, um, public health, like really anything that the city does is in some way touched by the decisions that we make and how we grow the city. Uh, our current plan was adopted in 1997. It was actually pretty, um, it was, it was well known around the country, it won a bunch of awards for being a very progressive, comprehensive plan. Um, it literally covered everything uh, back then because we didn't have a lot of other city plans on the books. Um, but we are going to try and not reinvent the wheel, but we're gonna try and prove the, what we have as a base of understanding of what Kansas City wants. We wanna update it for today's Kansas City and then guide Kansas City into the next 20 years. So this is our branding image. You might have seen it around town. We've got some ads out. Um, our, we have our website up if you happen to have visited the website. We took the uh, Norman Walkwell painting of the Spirit of Kansas City from when the uh, flooding happened in the West Bottoms, kind of destroyed everything down there in the 1950s. And Norman Walkwell painted this painting as kind of a symbolic gesture to Kansas City of the spirit of rebuilding. Uh, we kind of wanted to take that idea of just the spirit of Kansas City being, you know, entrepreneurial and forward looking and trying to improve the city. And we uh, updated it for, you know, a more diverse crowd. We've got all of our iconic images there in the Kansas City. Um, and so we just wanted something really bright and fun that would grab people's attention. And this is where we are right now, uh, the little bubble you can see on the right hand side. We're basically in a phase of continued engagement from what we've been doing the last year, but we're also prepping to move into the next phase, which is gonna help us to actually draft the plan. Um, as you can see, we started back in 2019 with our pre-planning. We've been doing largely public engagement online since uh, May of last year. And we're hoping to be able to go through the phases of writing the drafts, of taking it to the public for review, and then eventually to council at some point in 2022. So when I mentioned that focus, you know, kind of covered everything back in 1997, it's because we didn't have all these other plans already on the books. So we are not trying to supersede or copy what these plans have already done. We have these plans in place for a reason. These plans are managed by various departments within the city and coordinated with other regional actors like Mark. And we want to take what has already been done, this work that's been done, and we want to incorporate it into the comprehensive plan. And we want to make sure that any recommendations or strategies that we are putting forth are going to be synchronized with these plans and the direction that those departments are headed. So we're also in discussions with the city departments and the regional agencies that we work with all the time to make sure that anything that we're putting forward, they're in agreement with, and that's where they're headed as well. 
And then you also may be familiar, familiar with these area plans. Um, we have 18 area plans for the entire city. You live within one of those if you live in city limits. And these are actually just a much more detailed version of what a comprehensive plan is. These are gonna get down to actual parcel detail about you know, this parcel is for residential use, this parcel is for commercial use, this area is a conservation area. These are gonna get down to those detailed levels that really drive the decision-making on a daily basis, whereas the comprehensive plan is gonna give us the ability for that long range planning. And then if you haven't had a chance to visit the website, please go visit, it's uh, playbook.kcmo.gov. We have literally a year's worth of surveys and activities that we've been posting there since May of last year. Um, we did have a requirement to participate for people to register with just an email address and a zip code so we could kind of know who it was we were talking to and we could um, send out weekly newsletters. Since uh, we brought our public engagement consultant on board, we have opened up the registration so that people can participate anonymously. And that's kind of helped uh, up our numbers about with the people that have been participating online. Um, but yeah, we just encourage everyone to go there. There's tons of cool stuff. There's data books that tell you um, visually and textually how Kansas City's changed over the last 20 years. There's a lot of really cool GIFs, animations that show you how things have changed. Um, and we've got one general data book with just basic demographic information up there right now, but we're going to have more data books coming out. So if anybody is a really big nerd about that kind of stuff, the history and the numbers, um, it's, a, it's really interesting to take a look at. So since May of last year, we have been trying to uh, not only engage with people online, but we've been trying to think creatively about other ways that we could meet with people. So we've done over 70 of these types of presentations, these virtual presentations to as many organizations as uh, we could reach out to, um, that we work with a lot. Um, you know, a lot of people took a break from presentations for a while and then uh, started back up again. So it's been an interesting adventure trying to navigate all that. And in addition to things like social media ads and um, you know, the Instagram, Facebook stories that the city's social media does, we've also tried to do some uh, in-person things. We've got our bus ads, we put out billboards, we had these uh, mailed inserts in your water bill that you might have received if you uh, get a paper water bill. So it's just kind of trying to be creative and reaching out to as many people as possible. So um, we've had a lot of engagement on the website. Um, we're pretty happy with these numbers, but of course they always can be better, which is why that we've brought on our public engagement consultant. Uh, we're working at Parson Associates and a couple other contractors, and they are really um, they are really worked into the communities that we are trying to reach. The communities that's typically difficult for cities to reach out to and get engaged in processes like this. So we've been able to go through the last year and see what we were able to accomplish. And now with our public engagement consultants, we're looking to improve those methods and make sure that we're reaching out to not just the people that typically participate in these, in these plans, but people that it's often difficult for us to reach. So where we're headed next. Um, so over the last year, we've been just public engagement online, reaching out to people, sending emails, going to meetings. Uh, as much as possible. And now we're planning on continuing those efforts, but we're also going to start doing some committee work. So the empowerment committee is basically acting as our steering committee, but they have a very specific directive on empowering the voices of the people of Kansas City. So when they uh, are doing their work, they are expected to really focus on equity. They're expected to focus on making sure that the people's voices are being heard and any recommendations and strategies that are going forward. Uh, this is a very specific focus that our director wanted to make is that making this a people forward plan and really empowering neighborhoods to make the decisions. And then you also have um, around the empowerment committee, we have our four strategy discussion groups, strategy sessions. So each of these four groups, the mobility, visibility, serviceability, and livability, they're covering a, a certain sector of policy areas that um, we have been hearing a lot about on our website. Um, everything that we have structured with these committees and how we're moving forward has really come from the feedback that we've gotten on the website and the topics that people are telling us are most important, the issues that they really want to resolve. So each of these uh, teams is going to be discussing something different. We are starting with a series of meetings with two of these groups, mobility and visibility. 
They are actually going to start meeting here pretty soon in the next few weeks. We haven't made an official announcement just yet for when those public meetings will happen, but we're nailing down the dates right now. And if you're registered with the website or if you follow us on social media, you'll get an announcement uh, soon about when the public meetings will actually happen. So for mobility, um, basically everything transportation, um, that includes walkability, that includes trails, that includes biking, that includes parking requirements, um, that includes trying to create complete streets that service uh, multi modes of transportation in the city. And this is one of the groups that's going to be starting here pretty soon. We really encourage everyone to attend these public meetings. Uh, there's going to be, I believe, about four or five for mobility. And each of those meetings, they're going to try and cover a series of topics, have some discussions, figure out where we want to head in that particular policy area. And then that work is going to result in a set of uh, recommendations and strategies that will go to the Empowerment Committee for review. Once they review it and they've got their thoughts, it might come back to the mobility group. It might um, stay with Empowerment Committee for them to kind of figure out what we need to work on. Um, through all of this, we've got technical experts and um, subject matter experts from different uh, city departments and different agencies that we work with a lot who are helping us to make sure that any strategies and recommendations we're putting together are actually um, headed in the direction that those departments are planning for, that there are things that can be accomplished by the city to figure out the nuances of how we accomplish these things. So we've got a lot of moving parts and a lot of people working together. So mobility, some of the stuff that we've heard, oh, I apologize, my dog is protecting us from the people in the elevator. Um, the feedback we've heard so far on mobility is basically people want to make sure that our public transportation system is reaching out to all of the groups as much as possible and that it is um, faster and the quality is better and that the efficiency is better. Um, we've heard a lot about, you know, the public transportation is just it's not going as far as it needs to go and it's not getting there quick enough. Um, we've also heard a lot about uh, the encouragement of integrating um, public transportation, autonomous vehicles, ride sharing, these types of things that are going to generally reduce the amount of fossil fuels that are burning here in the city. Um, we've heard a lot about that. So figuring out how we can improve these systems and make them more environmentally friendly is definitely a huge topic we've heard about. But we've also heard from a lot of people that live in our, you know, more suburban areas that they really enjoy how easy it is to get around the city. So they definitely don't want to be losing that either. Um, extending the streetcar, making sure that our sidewalks and trails are more connected between different parks and different natural areas. And uh, back again to the complete streets, making sure that multimodal transportation is uh, a viable option here in Kansas City. So visibility is the other strategy group that's going to be starting here in the next couple of weeks. This one is focused a bit more on the visual aspects of the city that makes it a place that's desirable to live, something that makes it so Kansas Cityans want to be here, they want to live here, they want to engage in their communities. So the urban design, the architecture of the city, um, that is going to be, um, it's going to have a pretty significant place in here. That also is related to placemaking, something that um, creates an identity of an area. That's something that a lot of neighborhoods would be a really um, focused on is making sure somewhere is a place that they want to be, a place they want to gather, something that's got character um, and a unique, um, a new, unique per personality to that community. It's also going to talk about uh, historic preservation, which is a very important issue here in Kansas City. And it's also going to talk about, you know, arts, culture, the things that really make Kansas City what Kansas City is, the place that we really love living. And it's also, one last thing, it's going to cover um, the public realm, which I know is a very government-y term, but it's basically referring to anything that is owned by the city. So we're talking about, um, you know, the right-of-way along the streets, sidewalks, public parks, um, city-owned property, plazas, open space, things that are open by the city, how we can best use those, but not only that, but also make them attractive and make them functional for people. So the feedback we've heard on visibility so far um, urban design, you know, making sure that we're not veering, veering too far away from like the, the really cool architecture that makes Kansas City so beautiful, um, making sure that it's something that's quality that's not, you know, just standard throw up a building and, you know, who cares. We want to make sure that we're still implementing those good urban design practices that make the city attractive. Uh, protecting those historic buildings, of course, 
uh, making sure that public amenities are not only accessible, but they're well maintained and um, cleaning up blighted neighborhoods and enforcing property codes. That's definitely one we've heard a lot about. Um, there's, a, there's a lot of areas of the city that are in desperate need of some attention. And that's definitely an issue that we'll be talking about. So livability, this is uh, one of the strategy groups that's gonna be starting probably later this fall once we've wrapped up the first two. Livability is really gonna be talking about housing. <laughs> I think that affordable housing and having a variety of types of housing to choose from for Kansas Cityans is probably the number one thing that we've heard about on the website so far. And it's also in the news. I mean, it's, it's a huge issue here in Kansas City right now. So it's gonna cover not just housing availability, but it's also gonna cover neighborhoods generally and how we can empower neighborhoods to really work towards the communities that they want to implement like programs and um, other action plans that really strengthen the community and gives them a voice in what they want to look like and function. Um, community health is involved with this redevelopment and infill development, uh, ways to take abandoned properties and um, make them into something functional. Um, really trying to increase density so that you know services like public transportation are something more viable for those areas to use um, and you know just with the housing reusing those lots that are not being used right right now and could be being used so like i said the number one thing we've heard is that they want to make sure that we have more affordable housing and that there's a variety of types for people to choose from so it's not just a high-priced condo, condo or a single family home and that's that's all you get to choose from so really making sure we have a lot of variety. Um, people are looking for those walkable mixed use type of developments being located near their communities. People wanna be able to walk to restaurants. They wanna be able to walk to the services they need to get to. Um, and that is definitely a shift in typical, you know, development patterns we've probably seen in the country over the last 40 or 50 years. So it's, it's definitely an interesting thing, but it's definitely something that adds to the livability of a neighborhood and the character of a neighborhood. Aging in place, that's another major issue um, with our, you know, increasing aging populations, um, just demographic wise, we are not where we need to be as far as the amount of housing that is available for people to be able to age in place, which means not being forced out of their community, just because they need to change the type of housing that they require at that stage of their life. So making sure that people can not only raise their family in a single family home, but they can stay in their community as they might want to upgrade to, um, you know, apartment or a townhouse as they go through life. Um, that's definitely something that we'll be needing to address over the next uh, 10 to 20 years. Um, blighted neighborhoods, of course, falls under here in livability. Um, preserving and improving the existing housing stock is an interesting one. Um, a lot of people have discussed the fact that, you know, those abandoned lots, those houses that have fallen into disrepair, we really need to utilize them, not just from like a cost standpoint, not just from a providing housing standpoint, but just generally from a standpoint of making sure that these neighborhoods are intact, that they, um, their community is staying intact. And then of course, our big city amenities, everyone on the website loves to talk about how we feel we have a small town feel, but we have all those big city amenities that people look for in a place to live. Um, and making sure that we maintain that is definitely something Kansas Cityans have told us that they wanna make sure we continue to do. And then last but not least, uh, this is serviceability. This is definitely a word that we made up, <laughs> but this group is going to be talking about things that the city is directly involved in. So we are talking about the city services that we provide. We're talking about trash, we're talking about recycling. Um, we're talking about the infrastructure that the city has to maintain, which if you um, pay attention to the development world in Kansas City at all, you probably are aware that the uh, development of infrastructure for new development to um, undeveloped areas of the city versus the maintenance of existing infrastructure is kind of, um, eh, they're not like battling each other, but it's definitely a discussion that's happening right now. Um, you know, the cost and benefits to expanding infrastructure like water, sewer services, new roads versus the cost that the city has to, um, on a yearly basis, we have to maintain all of that infrastructure as well. Um, and Kansas City square mile wise and um, road miles wide is one of the largest city in the, in the country. So we only have a population of about 500,000, but we have more miles of road to maintain than most cities in the entire country. And we also have a wider 
um, city limit square mile area to continue to develop to. So with those two issues and you know the issues with maintaining infrastructure and also how to afford building new infrastructure, it's a very complicated issue. And I imagine it's gonna be a very long discussion for this particular group. And then also, you know, we're looking at um, environmental issues with this one, what the city can do to make our city more environmentally sustainable, um, sustainable development requirements that we might put onto um, people who are trying to develop in the city. Um, and then also just generally being more prepared to react to um, hazards. Like in the last year with the pandemic, it really kind of shone a, lo a light on the fact that we need to be prepared to be flexible and be able to adapt to things as they change. And so just quickly on that one, things that we've heard there, uh, the development incentives that the city uh, deals with on a regular basis, um, where those should be targeted and how they should be targeted um, is definitely a huge conversation. Um, maintaining the infrastructure that we have, um, the impacts of climate change on our existing infrastructure, how that might affect it um, is definitely an issue. Uh, infill redevelopment pops up here as well. And then um, supporting small businesses. The city has several programs that are related to supporting small businesses. And this is one that people have said that they really like to see an expansion on. Um, so next steps, uh, like I said, our empowerment committee has just started meeting. And once our first two strategy sessions get going, they will start receiving that information from them, the work that those sessions are doing, uh, recommendations and strategies that they wanna put forward. The empowerment committee will review, go back and forth a few times, staff will be involved, of course. And at the end of that process, through all of the strategy groups, staff will get together, we're gonna to write the draft, and then we're gonna put it out for public review. And that's basically kind of where we're headed through early of 2022. It's gonna be a lot of work, but we're really excited to get started. And I also wanted to name drop the climate action or climate protection plan, I believe it is. It's climate action plan, Mark has the climate action plan. The climate protection plan is the city of Kansas City, Missouri's plan. And they are actually about to start an update of their own. And we're gonna be combining forces. They're gonna have a page on our website where people can go and participate in their own strategy or their own um, surveys and activities. Um, but we're gonna be working together on that. We're gonna be sharing resources and just making sure that we're not you know, doubling up on public engagement and things like that. We wanna, we wanna work together. So definitely keep an eye out for when they are going to launch. I imagine it's in the next couple of months here. And then just finally, here's our website again um, and our contact information. If you have any questions or concerns or you wanna know more about how to get involved, um, you can email us at playbook.kcmo.org or you can send a direct message to me or Gerald Williams and we'd be happy to help. And I know that was a lot to throw at you guys, but um, I'm happy to answer any questions that you have. Yeah, Julie. Hi, Morgan. Okay, thank you so much. That was that was really helpful. I've poured through a lot of information on the website and that was amazing. Such a great intro. I have a question related to the area plans. Like some of those are quite old. I'll, I'll speak to the one in my area. The Lion Creek area plan was um, done in 2011, but it actually doesn't speak to um, many of the issues you addressed. And so I'll take serviceability for one. Mm -hmm. uh, along with land conservation. Um, so for example, in our Lion Creek area plan, um, there's a the massive forest I mentioned, it's unprotected. The current city plan says um, it, that that forest will be wiped out basically, a big road will be put in even though the road's not really needed. And um, you know, there's gonna be like you know, eventually shopping and residential, um, even though we have strong north to south corridors already in our Northland. Mm -hmm. A lot of er eradication of our green space here in the Northland, um, just, tr you know, trees going down on the daily and, um, and green space just disappearing. So will this, will this plan inform those future area plans, um, especially with the other work that's been done, like Mark, I believe, has designated high and medium conservation areas um, in their as part of their work and their research, um, but I don't see those actually being applied to our current area plan. So how, what will be the relationship between these more detailed area plans um, and how they get updated and the, um, the spirit playbook? 
Yeah, so first of all, that's a very fair observation. The, the development that's been happening in the Northland over the last 20 to 30 years has genuinely been explosive. And we don't really anticipate that's gonna be slowing down anytime soon. Um, you know, people who own the property, they are allowed to do pretty much, you know, whatever they would like to do with their property if they're going to, they were wanting to develop it. But having those area plans and this comprehensive plan in place allows staff to say, you know, the community came together and they created this plan and this is what they want to happen for that area. So there are um, not restrictions, but there are limitations that we can uh, try to enforce at the city level. Uh, one thing about those area plans and the comprehensive plan, they are adopted um, by resolution. They are not ordinance, so they're not law-based, but because they are plans that are created by and for the public, they carry a ton of weight as far as what the decisions the council is making in the end. Um, it doesn't always, you know, they don't always go along with exactly what staff is saying that the plan wants, but every case is different, every case is complicated. Um, so we just try and do our very best as long range planners to make sure that what was stated in the area plans and the comprehensive plan is what council is going for. As far as how often they are reviewed, the comprehensive plan is on a 20 year cycle generally. Uh, the area plans are typically on about a 10 year cycle. We just before starting this project, um, we had just wrapped up updating all of the area plans. So probably over the last uh, decade or decade, 12 years, they were updating each area plan and bringing them into um, kind of a more standard uh, format so that they would all kind of gel together and it was easy to navigate all of these area plans and understand where they were headed. Um, I believe that in the area plans, there are some things that they have done with land use identification for conservation areas. Um, but of course, you know, as things change over that last 10 years since it was passed, there's probably, especially in the Northland, there's probably a ton of things that have changed about the area. Um, I would say that um, the best thing to do is to advocate in this comprehensive plan process for the recommendation or the strategy to increase the amount of conservation areas um, that may be in a location. And if you've got specific places that you have in mind, of course, bring those ideas to the table. Those are things that we can definitely talk about, including in the plan. And soon your area plan will be updated again once we get done with this process. We just kind of go back around the carousel. And that'll be another opportunity to really um, voice for those areas that you believe should be con conserved. Um, as far as you know, the development that's happening up there, it's all just dependent on the market and it's all just dependent on the landowners and the developers and um, where they're trying to head. But the area plans give us a little bit of control over, you know, making sure that's not gonna just be a, a wide swath of commercial or something like that. So um, they do inform each other and they do work together and um, they're on a continually updating process. <laughs> So I just have a really quick follow-up question, um, and I definitely want to open it up to other people who also have questions as well. Um, so, so we go through this process as a city, and we get all this feedback, and we, you know, engage consultants uh, to get our community feedback. But then, how much weight does that actually carry when it comes to making decisions? like conservation decisions, like um, infrastructure, green infrastructure decisions. Um, wh when it gets down to the nitty gritty, when it gets down to the actual making of decisions, how much weight does this plan have? Uh, meaning the spirit playbook. I mean, it, it carries a considerable amount of weight because the people that are electing our council are the ones who are making the decisions about what they want their plans to say. Um, it also, it falls on staff a lot to really advocate. And I can tell you that as long range planners, that is our number one job is to try and make sure that these plans are being followed as closely as possible. Um, and, you know, if we can't get 100% of what we want for, you know, a piece of property that we've identified one way and a developer wants to go in another way, we try our very best to make sure that um, other measures can be taken as well, like uh, screening and um, lighting and all of those things. So it's not just kind of a yes or no question when it comes to a developer approaching us with something that they want and us telling them no, go away. Um, it's more of a, um, 
back and forth between the staff and between the developer, letting them know what the requirements for that piece of property are, what the citizens have told us that they want that property to look like into the future. And um, we go back and forth, we negotiate, um, staff brings the recommendation to the plan commission. Uh, the plan commission takes staff recommendation very seriously and it's often, um, it's a huge uh, consideration when they're making their decisions about um, cases. And then it goes to a committee, the Neighborhood Planning and Development Committee, where council people, a small group of council people, usually about four or five of them, will make another decision about the case. And then it proceeds to city council. So it goes through several layers of review and approval. And it's a constantly kind of changing and evolving situation with what the next case is coming in. Um, I can say that our planners, we advocate as much as we possibly can and we stipulate exactly what the citizens have told us that they want. Um, and then I can say that council and the plan commission take that very seriously as well. Um, does it work out 100% of the time? Unfortunately, it doesn't, but you do have strong advocates here at City Hall. Does anyone else have a question? Sammy? Uh, Sammy, your mic isn't working. I'm so sorry. I can't quite hear you. Uh, I see you're off mute. Um, do you, uh, is it okay if I let uh, Mary go? Um, and then uh, you can put your question in the chat. Thank you. Mary, do you have a question? Yes, I do. I have a follow up question. Hi, Morgan. Okay. Um, can you talk a little bit more about the connection between the climate action plan and a city protection plan and how that information is going to, um, just how that feedback is going to work? How does sure. is that working? Well, Mark has set up their climate action plan and we have been discussing with them about um, their plan and we have, I mean, it's already approved. So we definitely have all of their recommendation strategies that they are moving forward with. Um, and then, well, I should probably explain, we have created a database that is basically a gigantic monster of every plan in the city and also in the region that um, various agencies in our city departments work with and follow. And we've created this database so it can tell us what all the recommendations and strategies are for these other plans to make sure that we're incorporating them, um, at least being complementary to them in the comprehensive plan. As far as how the MARC climate action plan and the city's climate protection plan will interact with each other. Um, I would recommend maybe scheduling a presentation with that group once they get everything kicked off. Um, they'll definitely be able to explain that relationship a bit more. Um, just from the comprehensive plan perspective though, we are just trying to bring everybody together and we're trying to make sure that everybody is represented in the comprehensive plan and that our plan is, um, it's incorporating what they want from their plans that have already been established. Um, it's uh, it's kind of a complicated relationship, but we're just trying to make sure that anything that the city's planning on doing the next 20 years is in tandem and is complementary to anything that Mark's trying to do, to anything that um, the city's climate protection plan would like to do also. Okay, thanks. Uh, and then I think the next raised hand was Billy. Thanks so much. And uh, thank you again uh, so much, uh, Morgan, for the great presentation. Um, it's kind of crazy imagining uh, like what, the, what the world was like what last time a comprehensive plan for, was done for Kansas City in 1997, right? Um, in 1997, that was still, uh, um, have you heard about climate change? Do you believe in climate change instead of doing, or just let alone, do you know how to use yeah. Google? Um, it, was, it was a pretty uh, progressive plan. There are um, some environmental sustainability topics yeah. covered in focus, but the, it's definitely the field has shifted and yeah. it's going to be much more important. Oh, absolutely. And I'm just looking at, um, and I just, I remember looking over the, uh, the plan when I first moved to KC and it was like, like wow. Um, but it's just, it's just amazing how the new challenges that have arisen and just, you know, mm -hmm. I, I applaud all the work that y'all have done to make that even more. You know, expand that scope and uh, continue to make it something great. Um, just as a, you know, I'm curious, you know, there are, you identified a number of the challenges um, 
not uh, not e not even considering COVID, um, that you must consider and that you often face, you know, as a city planner going through processes like that. I guess I'm just curious, what are some of the, the I don't know, the any um, persistent difficult challenges that, you know, man, it'd be really great if we can get around this, that whether it's with engagement or something that you feel civic organizations and the public like you, you know, it'd be great if, you know, you know this, this could be done, whether it's to get more folks engaged or, you know, something that you run into that, you know, if you had, a, the, the, if you had a bajillion dollars question, I, su I suppose, um, to get everybody plugged in or uh, to make it, you know, truly like the best plan that, you know, you can say just, you know, chef's kiss when you're done. Um, what is, what, what can be done and maybe specifically in the context of where you feel civic organizations like Sierra Club, Pemos, or Putting Group, or other organizations can plug in and be of assistance. Well, um, engagement has, I mean, it can typically be difficult to grab a public's attention and have them sit still for a few hours a couple of times a month and put these plans together. Um, as you can imagine, it was uh, exponentially more difficult over the last year uh, with everything that was going on, not just the pandemic, but the social unrest and the protests and um, everything that was happening last year, it uh, it was it was pretty difficult to try and you know grab some attention. But also, we understood that that attention was probably where it needed to be. There was a lot of important things going on, so we just tried to, you know, make sure that we were staying visible without taking the microphone away from somebody else. Um, if I had a bajillion dollars, we would probably purchase ads on every TV station in the city. Um, but unfortunately, we don't we don't really have funding uh, of that limit. It's, it's definitely difficult to get people engaged um, on a long term basis. And these plans, they're only as successful as the public engagement that we're getting the, the public buy in. Um, they're only really successful if we're hearing from as many people as possible. Um, one of the things that was useful about the website and having that already set up by the time the pandemic hit is we were able to make it a requirement that people registered with an email and a zip code to see who was participating. And what that really told us is it told us what part of the city is actually participating the most and where we had gaps, where we were failing to reach the people um, in certain communities in the city. And I mean, we've had access to that technology before because everything was forced online. Um, it was really interesting to see the mapping of how that laid out. Of course, the Brookside area, the fourth district, downtown, um, those places were the ones that were the most engaged. And we um, typically over the last year have struggled to reach people in the Northland, uh, people in those Northeast neighborhoods, and also people further down South in South Kansas City. Um, so having that zip code information, um, while the last year has been considerably difficult, I think has been a huge bonus to how we have tried to craft our public engagement strategies. And moving forward, um, we're just really excited that in-person events are starting back up again. We're gonna try and get out there to as many um, you know, youth sports tournaments and farmers markets. And um, our public engagement consultants are really focused on finding events happening in the areas that we're struggling to reach. So we're really hoping that that's gonna expand our ability to engage with the public over the next year or so. Um, and yeah, we, um, we, we're just always looking for more ideas, um, more groups to reach out to, more discussions to have. Um, we're always happy to come to these meetings. So if you guys have any uh, ideas about uh, groups that we should reach out to, um, we, we would really appreciate that information. Okay, thank you. And uh, Dee, you have a question? Yeah, yeah, thanks, Kevin. Uh, thanks, Morgan. That was excellent. I, I've looked at the site and I've engaged with it and I've enjoyed having that opportunity, you know, to, uh, to weigh in on what I, you know, especially as a, you know, over 30 year member and I was around when they were doing the focus groups. Um, you know, uh, not part of that, but just I remember people talking about it and it was a really pretty big thing in Kansas mm -hmm. City. So, and I hope that this will be, you know, reach that level of uh, excellence too, which it seems to be on track. So, so you know, good job there. Um, I, I guess I have two questions and one is on the website, sorry, this is kind of technical, but it shows that there's like some been some past surveys and are those like over are they closed or it seemed like you could still vote on things or 
Yeah, for sure. So right now on the website, we've, we've done so much stuff over the last year that right now the website can seem a little bit overwhelming. Um, but we're working on a revamp of the website, um, a more organized homepage, more organized way to access um, not just the surveys and the activities that we've done, but also the reports of the feedback we've heard so far, um, discussion forums around those reports, and then places where we can report out what the committees are going to be doing and the work that they're going to be doing. So there will be a reorganization coming. Um, but right now, yes, our online activities um, page at the website, it's got pretty much everything that we've done over the last year, and they all remain open for people to participate in. When we do the website revamp, they're going to be moved to a different place. They're still available, and still we encourage people to participate because we're going to be continuing to bring in this information uh, all the way up until the point where we're done drafting the document. So we, we encourage everyone to continue to participate and always go back and participate. We continue to download our reports and gather what's um, been submitted there. So yes, of course, you can always participate in those old ones. Okay, and then, yeah, the second part is, uh, and our committee, we have a little committee that's been looking at the Kansas City's new street lights. And I'm curious, because <laughs> I know Kansas City is getting new LED street lights. Is that process going to be part of the planning or this planning process, or is that sort of separate? And that so, I'll take my question on mute. So that's kind of a good example of a very specific policy area that will be discussed in the comprehensive plan and how that might interact with other plans that the city has. So I know that at least a few of the city plans um, that are related to energy conservation and public works um, and uh, public safety. I believe that having those LED lights, that turnover is a, an important component of those plans. It's already something that the city's pursuing, as you mentioned. So how something like that would relate to the comprehensive plan is we would be putting forward, um, for example, if the if when that topic comes up um, in one of the discussion groups um, and it's very clear that everyone wants to continue to pursue that route of those LED plans, that would be something that gets incorporated in the comprehensive plan as a recommendation um, of where Kansas City needs to be headed. And what the plan would also do is it would outline specific strategies of how to accomplish that. So what it would do is probably it would refer to or speak to any other city plans that are already in the works to um, have the lights generally turned over to those LED bulbs. And then it also might outline ways that um, community organizations can work to um, you know, increase the usage of LED light bulbs in their own community on a small scale or um, other projects related to that that communities could engage with. Um, so the comprehensive plan is gonna put forward recommendations and strategies that bring in what the city's already trying to do, where we're already headed, but it's also going to be outlining things that can be done at multiple levels to increase those efforts. So not just at the city council decision-making level, but the city staff um, level of um, when we work on projects um, like uh, on specific boulevards like Truce or something like that. Um, we do a lot of um, area-specific projects in our department. So it's, you know, city council things, the stuff city staff can do. And it's also going to incorporate a lot of, you know, smaller projects that communities themselves can engage in and gives communities and neighborhood organizations something to focus their efforts around um, and uh, to try and implement on their own as well. Um, Morgan, we have a couple of good questions in the chat, but I just want to go, get to Don first. He uh, had his hand up first. Yeah, I, th this is Don Wallace. Morgan, thank you for the presentation. And, and I kind of want to follow up on, on what Dee was asking about here and get a little more specific about the streetlights issue, if I can. That's something, as Dee said, our legislative committee has been following. And, and what we're concerned about is not that they're LED lights, but the kind of LED lights that are being imposed. And the other concern is I, I, I'm kind of curious because this is an issue that's gonna be slipping under the radar in the next maybe year or two commitments, or well, less than a year, commitments will be made to a certain level of LED lighting that we see as very objectionable. And in many cities that have adopted 4,000 K lighting, very high glare lighting, cities have had to take those out because residents objected to them. Okay. And by the time this, your, your comprehensive plan comes out, this street lighting may be already in. So mm. the, the problem I see is, you know, the relevance of 
of the issues you're raising here, it, it's quite appropriate, I suppose, for long continuing issues here, but this is an issue that's kind of slipping under the radar mm -hmm. and it's, it's a, and the city has almost 100,000 streetlights that will be, that could be taking on these very high glare, very bright white lights, as opposed to the warm lights that are needed mm -hmm. to ensure environmental protection as well as human health protection as the AMA has indicated. It's not just crime and, 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 and public safety issues here that you, you were highlighting. It's far more than that. Yeah. I mean, it's a great example of how like a small, well, not a small, like in the, the grand sense of the word, but how a very specific issues like that can touch on so many different aspects of public policy related to the decisions that the city is making. Um, unfortunately, I, I can't speak too much detail to that because that I believe that that would be a bit more of a public works um, question and issue. Um, the, the best thing that I can do is recommend that um, you attend the comprehensive plan meetings coming up so that we can make sure over the next 20 years they are pursuing the types of lighting that are more beneficial to the community from not just um, you know personal perspective but from environmental perspective as well. Um, you know you got we got to try and do the work for the next 20 years, but also we can't lose sight of what's going on right now. Um, if you have concerns directly over these, um, I always recommend contacting your council person. Not enough people call their council people to let yeah. them know how they feel about something. Um, so I always recommend that. And if there's any, I'm trying to think, if there's any legislation or ordinances that are coming up, um, always you know attend those meetings and make your voice heard when it comes to those, um, those immediate concerns. Um, as far as the long-term concerns, though, I definitely recommend coming and letting us know specifically um, what type of lighting it is that you're looking for in your communities. And that's something that we can try and incorporate into the comprehensive plan of a uh, strategy that we should be pursuing on a citywide basis, or at least, you know, neighborhood specific or something like that. I, I think we've got a few more questions, but I do want to jump in really quick. It, Morgan, is it okay if we have you till eight? Is that fine? Oh, yeah, that's fine. That's perfect. <laughs> All right. I just, I think when you and I talked, it was till 7.30. So I just want to make sure. And uh, just also, uh, I wanted to make sure we got to everybody's. Yeah, of course. Thanks. The dog already got his run today. He's fine. He's passed out. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, Harold asked, I assume city council will approve the plan. But then what happens when someone proposes something inconsistent with the plan? How easy will it be for developers to get something inconsistent approved? Mm -hmm. So that one is, it's a bit more, speaking back a bit more to the kind of process that I was laying out with, you know, city staff starts at this level and we look at all of our plans and what the citizens have told us that they want. We make recommendations and then it moves forward to the general, you know, committees and the council bodies that actually do the voting and making the decision. Um, I can tell you that when people show up at those meetings and make their voices heard, that can have a very significant impact on decisions that council eventually makes. Um, with the plan, it gets approved um, and it gets adopted um, by a resolution by council. And it, you know, it remains in that, uh, that process of going through the city staff and then going up to council for decisions. As far as how easy for developers to get something inconsistent approved, it, it's just a very kind of complicated question. The area plans, I think, are a bit more um, related to specific development projects about, you know, what this parcel of land is going to look like and what we want to go there, whether we want it to be resident, residential, commercial, a mixed use development, things like that. So when it comes to in, us interacting with cases that development um, developers bring to us, um, it's a bit more of the area plan specifically that we are referring to and making sure that those proposed development projects are in compliance with the area plan itself. And like I mentioned before, if there's, um, you know, these development projects, they can have all kinds of, you know, specific details about them. If there's things that we can work with them on that doesn't, um, doesn't veer away from what the intent of the area plan was, we try and explore those options. Um, we, we just try and make sure that we are adhering to them as much as possible at the city staff recommendation level and bringing that um, those concerns and those ideas to the council. Um, we definitely voice them at every step of the process um, and making sure the council is aware of what our area plans say and what our comprehensive plan says as well. Um, and then Jim asked, how much input from non-residents who work in Casey Mo or come here for shopping uh, entertainment uh, and how much impact would sure. they would have? 
Yeah, we actually, um, we've tried to make sure that when we go to groups and we speak to them that we wanna get everybody involved. So if you live here, great. Um, but if you spend a lot of time here, if you work here, if you vacation here, we also want your feedback as well. Cause this comprehensive plan, um, it touches on so many different areas. It's not going to be something that's only affecting people that live here. It affects anyone that visits here or that works here as well. So we encourage participation across the board for the Kansas City Metro. Um, all of those voices are important as well. Okay, and then uh, Jacob or Cece, do you have a question? Yes, I had just a, maybe an easier question. <laughs> I know you had mentioned um, there'll be like a visibility and mobility committees, which will be um, given like what you said, like public meeting times. I was just wondering if those committees were already chosen or if it's, um, and like also to add on to that, how long those committees will be in existence, um, just knowing that we have so many um, like like environmental management commission and like we've already got some committees like in KCMO level and how that all works out. Sure. Um, the, the committees themselves, it's not so much a committee as it is a, a public meeting where we're gonna have a lot of discussions. Um, we're hoping to have enough participation where we have to go into several breakout rooms virtually um, and have you know in-depth discussions about the specific policy areas that have come up in the feedback that we've received on the website. So the basic structure is for these four strategy groups, they're the ones coming up with the strategies and the recommendations and putting them to the empowerment committee for review and um, for notes. And the, each group is going to meet approximately four to five times. It just depends on how we are able to progress through the issues that need to be discussed. Um, all of our, we have two long range planners that are working on the first two groups right now. They have a very detailed and specific structure of the issues that they wanna cover, the issues they wanna um, get feedback on at these meetings. So we are trying to keep it as organized as possible. Um, I think we're anticipating having the meetings last about an hour and a half, maybe two hours at the most. And we're trying to hold them on like a basically a monthly basis until we get to the point where we have accomplished the work that we needed to do in that policy area. Um, the first meeting for these groups, um, it's kind of like a pre-meeting, but we are bringing together like our subject matter experts from various city departments, the agencies in the region, and we're asking them, you know, look, this is what we're hearing on our website so far. We want you guys to be engaged with this process with the public as well, so you can help us to figure out the, you know, the really the minutia of these issues and making sure that they are things that we can accomplish, that we can work towards. Um, so we're getting them together and asking them to please participate, to give us that technical expertise that we're gonna need to put these policies together. And then um, after that initial meeting of just bringing them up to speed, it's open to the public. Um, we'll be putting out announcements through our website and our newsletter, and we're gonna try and cover the gambit on uh, social media posts and uh, press releases and things like that. So as many people as possible are aware that this meeting will be happening. Um, so yeah, it's gonna be open to the public. Um, we're anticipating holding the first meeting for the first two groups we're gonna do um, it, virtually for right now, but we have been looking into technology and the ability to hold a, um, a virtual and in-person meeting. So we're gonna try and work towards that goal of having a you know dual participation meeting. Uh, we're not quite there yet. Um, so the first meetings will be virtual and they'll be happening um, at some point here in June. Um, but we just haven't officially announced the dates just yet. It's exciting. And Julie? We're excited. <laughs> <laughs> You'll be fine. <laughs> I have uh, one more question related to those area plans. So mm -hmm. Speaking to the serviceability, uh, one of the things you mentioned um, that uh, data showing and people are talking about is that we've built more roads than we can maintain. Mm -hmm. And so does that then um, inform the area plans to say, yes, we've, we've actually realized that way back when, when we developed these plans, uh, we might have been parsing out the city separately and not really taking into account that we've built more roads than we can maintain. So speaking to the serviceability aspect, we want to review this area plan and say, hey, 
you know, should we reduce what we have planned for the future in terms of new roads? Mm -hmm. uh, like that's a very specific example of taking the learnings from this big plan and applying it to the area plans. Is that also a part of the strategy going forward? It definitely can be. Um, if that would be something that you would want to bring to that serviceability discussion. And I'm sure there's a lot of people that feel the same way that you do, that it is um, a major concern that, you know, the city's budget just doesn't provide us enough money to be able to maintain every mile of infrastructure that we already have in existence uh, in the city. Unfortunately, it is, you know, a year by year process of trying to address our major issues and um, just keep kind of chipping away at the block. Um, but yes, taking a look at where we are right now as far as development um, that has occurred over the last 20, 30 years, taking a look at all the infrastructure that we have to maintain, and then you know the considerations towards um, incentives that the council might award to developers for you know, new undeveloped land versus um, redevelopment or infill. Um, that's definitely strategies that can be incorporated into the comprehensive plan. So, um, you know, directives directly from the citizens about what they want um, as far as the incentive process to be, um, what considerations they want to go into that incentive process for council to be considering as they are debating, you know, whether or not to provide incentives, incentives to developers. Um, so yeah, that type of recommendation is definitely something that, um, you know, through this process, if that's brought up and that's something that these groups really feel strongly about, then um, it will be incorporated into the plan. Um, another thing that could also come from that is, you know, a recommendation that staff goes back and when we update the area plans again, you know, what specific things do we need to be looking for? Because those are a 10 year timetable and a lot can change in those 10 years. So, you know, maybe one of the recommendations that comes from this comprehensive plan is we review all the area plans for, you know, X, Y, and Z, making sure that we are um, staying in tune with the development trends and where they're headed and making any changes that the community wants to make um, at that point. Right, because I think like just, um, you know, there's a double-edged sword, there's a cost to our city, but there's also what these new roads mean, the ruination of existing wildlands. It means, you know, pollution, bringing pollution um, to places that didn't previously have it. So there's, you know, there's a huge picture there when it comes to just, uh, you know, putting a road somewhere because it looks like it should be there. <laughs> you know, there are many other considerations, I think. Mm -hmm. um, so, oh, well, that, yeah. that's, thank you, Mark. It is 100% one of the most complicated um, and varied issues that the city is facing right now. Um, there's so many perspectives that go into that discussion and it's definitely something we'll be spending a lot of time in in these committee discussions, I bet. Right. Do we have any other questions? I know we're kind of creeping up on that eight o'clock hour. So I just wanna make sure we, we grab any last minute questions. And, and Morgan, if we have any extras that come in, um, maybe they could be sent to our group and then we could kind of collect them for you. Would that be okay? Um, yeah, of course. Okay, great. Yeah. And yeah, I just, one more time, just encourage everyone to not only go to the website and participate in surveys and activities, but just go ahead and register with the site, give us your email, you'll receive our weekly newsletters, and that is the most direct way to um, be up on those announcements of when those public meetings are going to be happening and how to attend them. Great. Um, I just want to give a shout out to our local leadership here. We have our entire executive committee on this call today at a member meeting together. I'm really happy that you all made it. Julie, Jacob, Celestial, Deanne, uh, Eileen, and Jim, and myself. Uh, and, and Billy, our organizer, Don, our legislative committee uh, chairperson. Um, everyone's here and, and really cares about this issue. So uh, great job to the program committee, and uh, I'm really glad, Morgan, uh, you were here. To, you answered so many good questions. <laughs> um, a lot of things, this process is a lot clearer now to me, um, I know. And um, uh, all the new folks, uh, uh, new to us, new to me, please uh, reach out to us, stay in touch. Um, we have an email, uh, it's thbsierraclub at gmail. Um, that also sh should be our uh, handle for YouTube. THB Sierra Club uh, should be our YouTube page once we launch that, which will be soon. We'll have a recording of this uh, on that channel as well. Um, 
And uh, because we have leaders on the call, I just want to make sure I didn't uh, miss anything here either. If anyone has anything to suggest or announce. Thank you, Billy, for putting the volunteer interest survey on there too, in case anyone likes to really kind of uh, maybe try something more active, taking action, we're happy to uh, direct you to all the opportunities we have. Is Eileen still on the call? We can always do our outings, um, a call for outings leaders. And I think tomorrow there is a, oh gosh, help me with it, a navigating class, I think. Uh, yeah, that's the wilderness navigation class. And um, the next thing that would, which is already, you know, too late for that, but the next thing that we will be doing is um, you recommended braided sweetgrass by the author. However, we're going to do the Moss book that she wrote. Have you read that one? Oh, I have it by Robin Wall Kimmerer. I just finished Braiding Sweetgrass too, finally, but okay, I'll, I'll get on this new one for the book club. And it will be the last Wednesday in June. And uh, the reason we're going with that instead of Braided Sweetgrass is because someone volunteered to read it. So I'm not gonna turn him down. And so, but I think you might enjoy it since it's by the same author. Uh, well, everyone, uh, feel free to uh, clap your hands, do your sparkles for Morgan. Thank you very much, Morgan, for being with us. Uh, that was awesome. Thank you for having me. Um, we appreciate any opportunity to come out and talk to the public and get people engaged. And yeah, just keep an eye on our website and also keep an eye out for the climate uh, protection plan that's going to be kicking off here soon, too. You better believe we'll be uh, having an eye on that, of course. Well. Uh, and hopefully we'll uh, get to see you soon. Mm -hmm. Thank well, you. Have a good night. Thanks, Walk everyone. Say goodbye. Thanks, y'all.